Check this one out. What? I don't know, you know. Welcome into Fat Beans Coffee Lab. I am the Bean Man. The roasting sweater's on, so it must be a little chilly in here. We got the heat turned on. It should be uh, should be getting toasty here at any moment. Get the roaster going, got the heat on, so we should be all right. Anyway, welcome into Fat Beans Coffee Lab. I am the Bean Man. This luxurious space is the Bean Lab, so uh, come along as we turn some beans into some fabulous dreams. We're going to change things up a little bit and do a bit of a bit of reconnaissance. All right, so first we're going to just check the roast level. This is going to give us a little bit of kind of a, a leg to stand on as we're trying to determine what we want to do. We got a couple of things set up here. All right, anyway, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to test the roast level. And this should help us kind of when we're tasting to know where we need to go next. And then if it tastes like there's a little bit of lacking flavor, maybe some acidity lacking, to just kind of coffee taste, I might take a little lighter. And if it's a little astringent or just a little too green or grassy, I might take it a little, a little darker. Now I will tell you, I do try to get most of my samples to medium. And look at that. He can still, he can still roast a medium, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, there we go. So that's good. And full disclosure, all of my samples I do at medium. Um, it just kind of gives me a nice jumping off point to kind of discover where I want to go next. I, when I cup, I like to keep everything exactly the same. So I like to isolate all the variables the best that I can. I do that by uh, keeping consistent grind size, keeping a consistent weight, keeping consistent water temperature, keeping a consistent time of brood steeped. Uh, that is the same it's the same ritual i do for every single cup of coffee um now obviously you could say well bean man every coffee needs different grind sizes and every coffee needs different water and yes but what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get a consistent jumping off point so that i can make choices from so if i were to adjust it for i mean yes the more adjustments you make the better you're going to make that particular coffee taste like um you know, roast level is just one variable. So water and temperature and time, these are all variables that are going to, you know, change the overall quality of the coffee. And that's it's a good lesson for all coffee drinkers to know is that, you know, there's a lot that you can do at home with good and with bad coffee to make it better. Uh, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to isolate certain variables in an effort to, um, you know, kind of be able to make choices. Ah, choices. So what we do is 8.2 grams. 8.2 grams. You know, some this roaster is a little kind of a hog, so. I do what's called a 4E on this roaster. I do 4E always. And that's a little bit finer. It's about 900 microns okay to be honest just by smelling it I think I might have overcooked this coffee just a little bit so we're on 8.2 8.2 back in here. And then we'll just do 150 milliliters of 205 degrees Fahrenheit water. Okay. 
So 150. And then what we'll do is we're going to let this steep for about four minutes. Okay, so nice fruitiness. Not bad. Hmm. It's a nice place to cleanse my spoons. Just skim everything off the top here. Get all the heavy bits out. Now I'm going to let this cool just a skosh. Try to get it down a little bit below room temperature. <laughs> Not below room temperature. Just running my mouth. What I'm going to try to do is get it uh, about to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, I'm gonna do that simply by just waiting. Just gonna wait. A couple of minutes and then we'll start cupping it. Word on the street is from what I've been reading about other people who've done this coffee is it tends to taste better as it cools. So there's one thing I'll definitely need to evaluate a little bit as we go. The hell, let's get right down to it. Okay, so there's definitely a very like apple-y taste, almost like a mollic apple taste. Um, mm, pretty muted, honestly. It just tastes kind of a little dull. I think honestly, the most interesting thing is kind of this apple-y textury taste there is a i mean there's caramel notes so i definitely need to draw out the pre-development phase a little bit so while i'm roasting the coffee i may want to make an, like a couple of notes but i want to stretch out the development the pre-development phase and that's the time when the coffee starts to hit what we call yellowing and it moves to first crack um i want to just Slow down the roast and hang out there for a little bit. So there's definitely a caramely taste. Definitely an apple taste. It's almost like a nutty pecan taste. I think all these flavors, you know, together, make for a pretty good cup of coffee. I just, I don't want them just to become too... Too much crowding. I mean, honestly, I could take, I could leave that, I could take the coffee medium and be just fine. Like, it'd be fine, but I think I'm going to try. I'm going to try to keep it light, lighter than I do with normal. Um, normally, with my medium roast Central Americans, um, don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. And I've done that with Costa Ricans in the past. So definitely like a quick, just almost flowery taste. And then it transforms it into that, like I said, there's like a molic, a very present molic acid taste. It jumps then to a very nutty pecan flavor is like the, the aftertaste. So we we'll just have to get in there. I think, like I said, I think I, mean, I got a, I got a plan. I got a plan. All right. Well, hell let's, uh, I, I don't know. I have to get in there and check. I leave most of those things to the Bean Queen. I let her have access to all those. She's a little bit just, just better at that stuff. Let other people exercise their strengths. All right, we're in. 
you know, my thoughts about uh, here's why I think like teenage drinking and even like 20s drinking is bad. Let me tell you, let me preach at you for a second. Here's why it's bad. Because when you're that age, you barely get hung over. And it almost sets like a bad precedent in drinking that like drinking is this fun thing that you can bounce back from and do it like four or five times a week. And that's just not how the world works. Uh, it sets a bad precedent. Because then if you wait till your 30s like me to start having kids, you're like, oh, I'm going to go out and drink. And then you're hung over. And being hung over with kids is arguably the worst thing on planet Earth. Because your kids do not give a give a hoot. They do not give a curmudgeonly care that you're hung over. And how do you tell a two-year-old that daddy got too bombed? There is a good episode of Bluey out there that deals with this just this very thing. So, I mean, there is some stuff out there to help help uh, help parents, but nevertheless. I did a lot more drinking than I should have in college. I could down like 10 or 12 drinks, stumble my way to bed at 3, 4 a.m., get up. Yeah, man, I used to, I heard you guys knocking out like a case of, of keystones and me and a, me and a buddy, we could, we could blow through a, a case in like two hours. And that would be like a Thursday or a Wednesday. <laughs> that would be like a little study case. Um, that is not a flex by any means. Yeah. Case race, Edward Forty Hands, you name any dipshit thing, uh, we were doing it. And it's because we were lonely and scared. <laughs> we were lonely and scared and didn't know who to tell. But the baby blues, they would listen. They would listen. Okay, so that puts us at a yellowing 168. Looks pretty good. I'm going to put my nose on that. Uh, five minutes. So now... We just need to drop this number a little bit, and I'm going to do that via this. Yeah, that's nice. Nice little. That's nice. It's my art face. So we really want to. So we really want to capture the roast. So this will put us for three minutes, if all things stay consistent here. Um, but. To be honest with you, I want to slow that down just a little bit more. So I've got my fan kind of kicked up here, and I'm doing this to just try to suppress the roast. I probably won't touch this fan again for a while. Oh. Gonna put us at like nine minutes and thirty seconds right now, and that's it's not the worst thing in the world. Honestly, I don't want to go to P6 just yet. Maybe I'll go to P6 and I hit 190. Because that would put me at 8. So we're at 8 minutes. P6. Let's maybe stretch this out for 1 minute. Maybe a minute and a half. That would be a nice little roast. That would be a nice little guy. Starting to get some early pops. There we go. So it's switched. I just switched this. Now this is bean temp. Not, so that's... Infrared, and that's bean tap. Get some early pops. Listen about two more pops. One, one ninety-three. P five. Let me kick that up to P six. A little bit more of a violent streak going. Okay, there we go. That's a good first crack. I don't want to lose it. Slow my fan down just a little bit. I need to get something back. I'm losing it. Damn it. I'm still all right. I mean, I'm still cracking. All right. This is going to be a, still a good roast. I mean, 111 was what I wanted. I'm at 18%. I'm two minutes off first crack. So I think for all intent and purpose, I just might try to clean up that uh, little dip in the start of it. 
I know what I, I know what I, I know where I'll make the adjustments on it. So I'll do another, I'll do a playback of this just to keep the first part of the roast good to go. And then we could take it home. Perfect. That's pretty good. Right what I wanted to do. Yeah, we definitely, we can do better than that. We need to just, we might have to sacrifice a little bit of our pre-development time and get a little bit more synergy going into that first crack. All right. All right, so tag it and bag it. We got a plan. The one thing I'm going to change is I dropped from P6 to P5. I'm going to eliminate that drop from P6 to P5. I'm going to go from P9 to P8 to P7 to P6. When I get to first crack, it looks like when I... I mean, when I got to 190, I didn't really have much fanfare. I might even, I'm going to probably walk the fan down and keep it at P6. So I'm going to walk the fan down, and I can always walk the fan back up. So I'm going to extend my pre-development with the fan. I'm going to do the P5 fan. But right when I get to that 190 mark, I'm going to keep it at P6, and I'm going to actually move off of the fan. I'm going to put it back down to P4 and see if I can't keep a little bit of energy in the roast. And I'm proud to say that after after running a business... For almost two years now, I finally wrote a business plan. It only took me two years to put away my ego and actually write down what I'm doing. And uh, you know what? If you're out there and you have a plan to start a small business, you need to write a business plan. Um, so what it is, is it essentially, you can find them anywhere, but it's going to ask a couple of leading questions like, who's your customer base? What are you selling? Like, what's your mission? Um, and then from there, like, you discuss your, you know, what your product is, what your like position is, like, what does it do for people? Who your ideal customer is? Who's a customer you'd like to grow into? Um, you know, just some strategies, like, what are the products that you're trying to sell? Um, and then it goes into some more specific things, like startup costs that I should have done. Um, I think if I was able to have a better understanding of some of the startup costs that I was in, you know, kind of encountering, I could have made better decisions um, instead of just kind of doing everything on the fly, uh, specifically like licensing and, you know, just trying to do things a little bit more sure up. It wasn't uh, anything too detailed, but I think it was nice for me to just see it, just to see it all out there with all of its flaws and everything. Because I feel like I've been hiding a little bit from legitimizing this business. And I think anytime you do something, it, you know, just because you call it a business doesn't have to like make it evil. It just, I think it just makes you think about things in a much more realistic mindset. So let's, uh, let's do the damn thing. Let's do it. Throw some bleeping beans. Just jump in with both feet. Start treating it like a legitimate business. Absolute day one. And I think you'll be much, much happier that you did that. How do you think this plan would have helped you earlier in your roasting? I think it would have legitimized a couple of things I've been thinking about, like uh, different products, thinking about what my customers want specifically. Like that first year, I was so outside of the bounds of like who I was trying to get to. 
Um, you know, I just, I didn't have a clear focus goal. Like I didn't even, I should have been adjusting it like every month. I should have every half a month when I first went to the farmer's market, I was like, Hey, this is the kind of cl clients I'm getting. This is the kind of people I'm seeing. This is the kind of people I'm talking to. And I was just so pig headed that, and I was, you know, I was so worried about failing. Like I was like, I'm going to go there and no, everyone's going to laugh at me and everyone's going to not want my, like just pathetic shit like that that had I been taking detailed notes of like, these are the kind of people I'm talking to, I could have constantly been refining my product real time to them, which I did do in year two and writing it down. I see that process, but had I been writing something down, at least modeling something, it would have just the, like the fear and the insecurities and all of this nonsensical shit that I had manifested would have not had evidence to back it up. And I think that is definitely something that I started seeing when I was writing it down. Um, also, like having ideas and really when I have like, I have a bunch of wild ideas, just putting them down, you know, and maybe highlighting them and then saying like, is this something we want to monetize or not? So, um, but like it all starts to fit together in this big web uh, that, you know, I wish... I, I said, especially in that first year, the second year, I think it started happening despite the fact that I had nothing written down, but boy, if I just would have, like I said, just kind of at least had like a skeleton of a plan, like you can always change it. And it's not like you're going to go and like, especially like you and me, like we're not going to go shopping around to banks. So it's not really for banks. It's not for investors. It's for yourself. Like you as a sole proprietor, you're the investor, but also there's a later stage where you start to really start seeing the, the, you know, the, how the, the sausage gets made. And then you can start asking yourself, is this something I want to learn or do, or can I farm it out? Cause I am, I'm very afraid of the accounting piece. I get afraid of like taxes. I get, I get afraid of things that I'm not comfortable with. So what's in the bean man, just pouring it all out, but in, that's why I like talking about it. Cause then if somebody else is kind of having the same insecurities, they can be like, all right, well, at least this dope dope is way through it. So I think with a business, it's okay. Like the business will still be an organic and fun and moving thing. It just will have a place for you to put your thoughts down. And that's sometimes I think the make it up as you go is a defense mechanism. I think it's, Oh, it's almost like a failure mechanism. Like, cause you're like, well, then if I'm making up as I go and I fail, then it's not like I really failed. And that's at least that's how I kind of go about it. And yeah, after two years, I don't want to fail. So, <laughs> and even like, even if that means that like, I don't, it's not like setting sales goals and targets and stuff because I, I'm not, I built my business the way that I have to avoid that. But, um, it is nice to just have a direction not feel so, so aimless. All right. So we're here, here we come to that 196. So at 190, now this roast is going a bit faster than the last one. So maybe, maybe I don't make all the adjustments that I was planning. Maybe I just let things kind of, kind of materialize as we go. And we're not to 190 yet, so we'll get to, we'll just pull the pull P6 here, and then I'm gonna wait 10 seconds to make sure nothing dramatic happens. Then I'm going to go P4. I mean, the whole roast time is a little bit speeded up, and that's like I said, I think it's getting warmer down here. Air temperature and the machines, everything's hotter in the machine, so makes sense. Come on, hang on. First crack. He's punching. Screw it, let's surf it on this P6. Let's ride it out. Damn, this coffee just gets that first crack. It just hits the bricks. I think that it's just so game dominated and also food and drinks. Like I'm not saying like if I think if I did it like more, but 
I just think there is some guaranteed home roasters and I don't need all home roasters, but like I enjoy like the, the repertoire that you and I have created, like how we're both kind of figuring this out together. And I think I'd like to be able to, to at least be making content for people like that. Cause I think there's a lot of us who are out there reading, you know, we're watching the mill cities. We're, you know, reading the Scott Rose, we're doing all that shit. And it's just, I feel like there just needs to be a community, like a, a live action forum of people that can talk through some of this stuff because it is, it needs to be a little bit more like simplified. It needs to be brought down a little bit because I just think that the what's out there is so geared to the upper echelon. And I think there is a whole shitload of home roasters coming out of the woodworks. And I think YouTube is where they're, they're looking for videos. I get a good, I get a kick out of that. This roast slapped, but like we just freaking knocked it clean out of the park. That's the roast we were looking for. This dog will hunt. That's the roast. Ooh, check out that. Right. So we're gonna, we are actually doing some, this is a Panamanian coffee. Kind of semi production. We're doing batch after batch. I think we finally got it in the sweet spot. We're roasting about two pounds at a time right now. Ah, oh, hell. MQT guy, why did you not let. Why did you not remind me to dump my chaff filter? It's on you. This is on you, man. You've got gonads. I don't touch that thing when the roaster is on. Bah. I think my secret to culinary success is... Uh, I don't really have much feeling on my fingertips. Yeah, it's going to tumble around in here for 12. So it's going to dry the coffee out, and then it's going to uh, develop some flavors, and then it's going to roast it. So we're going to do all of that within about 12 minutes, and I'll kind of try to show you as we're going. Asbestos fingers, I know. They called me in college. So that's green. And at this point, it's still got a lot of moisture in it. And we're just trying to get it hot enough where we can steam out all that moisture. That usually takes about five minutes where we're trying to, you know, as quickly as possible without burning the coffee, get as much of the moisture out as we possibly can. Uh, anywhere from five minutes on. It's going to be reaching what we call a development phase or pre-development phase. That's where we're going to use like chemistry. And I say we, but the roaster and the heat are going to use chemistry to break down carbohydrates into glucose, sucrose. Uh, there's a couple of different acids in coffee. Uh, this particular coffee has a bit of a malic acid that will burn off pretty quickly. So we are going to try to be a little bit delicate with it, especially towards the back end. Uh, to save some of our apple flavored notes that I tasted. Um, and then it's going to reach first crack when it starts to like explode, meaning it really just can't hold any more of the chemical reactions going on and it will pop almost like popcorn. At that point, we are roasting coffee. What temp do you typically consider dry end? Uh, I know it's more of a sight smell thing. Oh, buck 70. 170 is a nice, uh, a nice round number that I've kind of come up with where I'm like, that's usually what I think dry end is. Dude, this, this freaking recipe, I, I am uh, proud of myself. I feel like I, I feel like I finally, I've made it. I'm, and I'll be honest, I'm just now starting to understand it myself. Um, really in the last week or two. Uh, so if you remember the last time I was on Twitch and I was just bitching about 
not being able to do light roast. So I've been down here kind of secretly coming down. I've had a, I've had some extra Kenyan I want to get rid of, and I've been messing around with it. Uh, fan. If you notice, I've been using a lot of high fan. I've uh, I'm not ready to really divulge any sort of secrets about the fan, but fan. When it comes to pre-development on the bullet, the fan is your friend. And you can always go fan, and you can actually walk off the fan, which is some roasters are kind of scared to, to walk off the fan. They feel like fan is like one of those things you got you to gotta go with. Hot. Oh, yeah. You know, that's the... Uh, that's the hip thing to do. I was talking with a guy on YouTube and how like that's me and him were talking about coffee trailers and I was like it's it's ironic cuz I'm a coffee roaster and I you know I got an espresso machine but the last thing I want to do is a coffee trailer because I don't want to get tied to drinks. And then there's that you know that bakery slash like milk drink kind of people that you know got that cut their teeth in cafes and stuff that they're like that's all they want to do. Um I know that's probably where the markup money is but my heart is with the roasts my heart is with the beans so what can you do my heart is with the roasts consider check this one out and that seemed to work out just fine Now we are making waves with this coffee. Crack your code. Crack the code. I've got the outdoor exhaust working like a Swiss watch. I mean, my two-year-old son lives right above me. I go in there after I roast sometimes just to, just to help him out. You know, sleeping's tough when you're two. And I don't ever smell anything, so that's a good. That's that's a win. Not uh, inundating my youngest with just coffee smells all the time. It's kind of like uh, just like it'd be like a kitchen exhaust fan. It actually ports out here, so you can see this is the cloud line. I have it installed in this cabinet, and then it actually filters out. Doors right here. So it's, I've got it doing an S loop, which isn't the most, uh, yeah, more of a fume hood. Um, when I first got into this, I had it touching the roaster and it would, it would screw up the roast. It was just, it would, uh, be, it would be forcing sucking too much air because how the air flow works in this is it comes up out of the chamber here through an exhaust port here and out through here and the impeller fan is here back here so what happens was is it was just frost in the roast so i found it easier to get a little higher i'm not a harbor center i'm not an engineer. i'm not an engineer so being man you've mentioned preheat temps a couple of times when i talk about my roast i've always kept it high to try to get through dry phase quick but uh, do you think that might be affecting my roast? So let me use a couple of different roasters that aren't me to kind of try to explain it. One, every roaster would agree. So if you got your Joe Morocco's, you got your Robert Haas, you got your uh, Scott Rose, you got your Willem Boots, they're all going to say the same thing. Dry phase does not affect the flavor, okay? So it doesn't have anything to do with flavor at all. So you could hypothetically want to move through dry phase as quickly as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. If yeah. you're moving through it as quickly as possibly without burning it, you still are creating what is called synergy. The beans are soaking up heat. They're becoming a mass. They're a, they're a heat mass. It's a ball of heat. And if you are pumping it just like heat, 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 heat early on, like they're like getting stronger and stronger with that heat, it's going to make it more difficult to slow the roast down because the beans have so much like reserved heat 
So if you pump them up full of heat, they're going to, it's almost like a spring, like the tighter you make it, it's going to shoot out. So hypothetically, when you come up, you want to make sure you're giving it heat, but you don't want to give it so much heat that it, you just, it gets out of control. So by lowering it, you kind of lower your curve down a little bit. So as you have that ROR, it's a slower, more subtle curve. That's why a lot of people say like 50% of the roast should be drying phase because hypothetically it does nothing to the flavor, but it does set your curve up. So if your curve is way up here, like by the time you come down, like you're already past the pre-development phase. But if your curve is too low, well, then you never get anything to go. But if your curve is nice, it's going to kind of set up the rest of your roast. It won't affect any flavor though. Now this is a... Lighter roast that I wanted to stretch the pre-development out. Mm. Really tasty. There's, like I said, there's a rich, there's a nice malic acid in here. The malic acid burns off pretty quickly. That's your apple taste. And that's why we're not going any darker. Even though there's caramel and sugar in this coffee, I think this apple taste needs to be preserved. Getting ready for our turn. Here we go. And it's going up. So now I'm, I'm actually giving it everything I got. There's my, that's my metal temperature, just about 212, like 200 and so degrees. Excuse me, that's my IBSC, that's my metal temperature. Yeah, they've got the uh, Aleo 2 kilogram coming out. I'm half tempted just to get it because I do so. I've talked, I'm starting to talk to so many people about this one. 18, they see it kind of stalls. The AIO. 19. Yeah, she's fighting there. 19. Yeah, it's been at trade shows for about a year now. They should just send me one. 19. See how I went to 2019? Yeah, that, that price point's going to be hard. You just get like four bullets. Just buy four bullets. 18. And now we're moving down. 145, 18. So I just kissed 20. Should be 17. So now that's our, our curve set and we're moving down. I'm very interested because, like I said, I have pushed, I'm starting to push people to buying this roaster. I do like that it actually is inside of the roaster. So it drops in the machine. It's all self-contained. That means all of your chaff, all of your nonsense, it's all, it never leaves the machine. So, I mean, when we're talking about a shop roaster, like the bullet being a shop roaster, like it's all built in there. On 68, and there I am at 12. Eleven, one seventy, my art phase. It's gonna be like a high end coffee. Sh it's gonna be for like the small coffee shops. So look at it this way: you own a small coffee shop. You want to be your own. You want to be your own roaster. It's going to give you a little bit more capacity. It's going to look really nice. All the chaff, all the smoke, all the BS is going to be self-contained. 
It's going to sit on a little, you know, it'll be a nice presentable unit. Customers will be able to walk up, look at the coffee as it roasts. It'll be able to sit like on a workbench or something nice. And that's the clientele. But it is, I, I don't think it's going to be, it's not really geared towards the home roasters market. Um, would I be interested in it as like a farmer's market roaster? Yes, but $16,000 is just, I can, I can make it work on Judy. I can make it work. I'll, I'll do it. I would rather spend that, the extra money, get a good gas roaster, become the consummate professional, become like work my way up to that Robert Haas kind of level. Uh, and then, just come back to the bullet and be able to do what I need to do. That's a little high. There we go. Come back down. Come back down. The bullet was a... The bullet was and is just a work of art for its price point and what it can do. And maybe someday I'll be saying the thing, same thing about the AIO, the EO, or whatever, however it is. Yeah, it's how many degrees Celsius is increasing every one minute. And it's based off of this. This is the uh, metal temperature. So eight degrees Celsius every minute. I lost the whole year of my life screwing around. Oh, I've done it, but yeah, no one, no one said I was a smart man. All right, guys. Well, thanks for kicking it with me. You made two hours just fly by, so.